So let's talk about penile rehabilitation. Penile rehabilitation is also called erectile tissue preservation. And penile rehabilitation is the use of any drug or device at or after radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy to maximize erectile function recovery. That's as simple as, as it is. The purpose is to prevent erection tissue damage. That muscle and the endothelium in the penis were trying to protect it from atrophy and degeneration. And our goal is to get you back to where you were before your prostate cancer treatment. The strategies that are used, neuroregenerative drugs, PD-5 inhibitors, that's the group of drugs that Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis belong to, and penile injections. There's very little evidence that transurethral prostaglandin or vacuum devices are a rehabilitation strategy at this point in time, although I think we're going to have trials in the not too distant future that are going to address that. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about neuroregenerative drugs. I will tell you it's a very hot topic in the field at the moment. Drugs that are developed specifically to prevent the nerves from being damaged, whether it be surgery or radiation, and increase the chances of those nerves regenerating after trauma. We do not yet have a good neuroregenerative drug. I'm certain in the future that we will. So stay tuned for that. What are the principal arguments against rehabilitation? Well, there is evidence in the literature that it is good, certainly in animal models. There's some evidence in humans, but it's not definitively proven that it works. I will tell you my very personal, although probably very biased opinion, penile rehab works. We're very big fans of penile rehab here. The other issue is that people will say that, well, the animal studies don't really translate into the human model, and that may well be the case. But the biggest argument against rehab is high cost. Is the cost of having to buy Viagra several pills a month for the first 12 months after surgery. We've costed it out. If you have no insurance coverage and you're a typical patient in our practice, we have cost you somewhere between $1,500 and $2,500 for the course of 24 months. If you're a 50-year-old man and you have 25 years of sex ahead of you, that's about $100 per annum to maintain your sex life. So in the grand scheme of life, it's not a huge cost. The arguments in favor of rehab are erectile dysfunction is associated with depression and reduced quality of life. It's estimated that the quality of life of men who have erection problems is similar to that in men who have chronic renal failure. Erection tissue damage is time dependent. We didn't talk about that. We did talk about nerve injury and absence of erections causes atrophy and degeneration of erection tissue. That is time dependent. How long do you have after prostatectomy without erections before erection tissue damage starts occurring? I would say that's no more than six months and in some men it may be quite a bit less than that. We like to start rehab within the first four months of surgery and in fact I'm going to show you our algorithm in a second and we actually start it before surgery and before radiation if you come to see me before treatment. I believe the animal and human studies are supportive and 90% of sexual medicine experts worldwide do rehabilitation. That means that there has to be something to it. So this is our penile rehabilitation protocol. It's very complicated. I'm not going to go through it in minute detail. But patients are generally broken down into two groups. On the left, you'll see the patients who come to see us before surgery. Increasingly, we see patients coming to see us before surgery. They tend to be the patients who are most anxious about their sexual function. If they come in before surgery, we treat them with a PD-5 inhibitor for two weeks prior to surgery. I have Viagra up here, but I'm using Viagra as a generic term for Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis. We treat them for two weeks before surgery. We tell them that when their catheter is in place, that they continue the low-dose Viagra going to bed at night. That's 25 milligrams, a quarter of a pill every night. And that when the catheter comes out and the surgeon says you can start trying to get erections again, usually two to three weeks after surgery, we want them trying a full pill, 100 milligrams of Viagra on a few occasions. And then we want to see them at six weeks after surgery. If they come in after surgery, we give them a prescription for Viagra when their catheter comes out seven to 10 days or so after surgery. And we tell them the same thing, 25 milligrams at night, but we want you once a week trying a full dose pill with stimulation and let's see how you do. At six weeks, we divide patients into those who do well with pills, Viagra responders, and those who don't do well with pills. I can tell you, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, close to 1,000 prostatectomies a year, some of the top surgeons in the world, 15% of men at six weeks after surgery 
actually respond to a PD-5 inhibitor. 85% of men do not. Why? Even when nerve sparing is perfect, those nerves are bruised and swollen. You cannot respond to Viagra Levitor Cialis unless those nerves are functioning at a reasonable level. And that's why men don't do well in the early stages after radical prostatectomy with the pills. If there are Viagra responders, we say, we want you getting two to three erections a week. So 100 milligrams of Viagra, two to three times a week with stimulation, whether you have sex or not, whether you have an orgasm or not, is irrelevant. What we're looking to do is bring blood and oxygen into your penis and stretch that muscle. And that's how we think rehabilitation works. On the non-erection nights, they take a quarter pill going to bed at night. So you can see that if a man is using three full pills a week and four quarters, that's a total of four pills a week, 16 pills a month, that comes, becomes expensive. The 85% of men who don't respond to Viagra, Levitra, or Cialis within the first six weeks, immediately at that time point, we'll say, we think you need to be getting erections. You've gone six weeks without an erection, and we put them directly onto penile injections at six weeks after surgery. Now, many men say to me when they come in to see me, well, I'm only six weeks. How about I give it another couple of months to see if pills work? The time to best response with pills in the first year after surgery is the first month. If you don't respond in the first month to six weeks, you're not going to respond till the second year after surgery. Why? The nerves have gone to sleep. You can't respond. Indeed, there are men who come to see me who had good erections with Viagra at four weeks, who at 12 weeks have no erections with Viagra. The low point in erection function after radical prostatectomy is somewhere between three and four months. And I know you've all read and you've all heard surgeons say, oh, my patients get erections with the catheter in place. The week after the catheter comes out, they use Viagra, they're functioning perfectly. My question for those surgeons is, what's that man's function at three months? Because likely, many of those men will not be functioning because the bruising and swelling and scarring that occurs around those nerves doesn't occur overnight. It takes several weeks to occur. So the non-pill responders go straight to injections. And again, we tell them two to three erections a week. And on the non-injection nights, low-dose Viagra going to bed at night. Towards the end of the first year, beginning of the second year, we tell patients, we want you challenging yourself with Viagra 100 milligrams every month. And that's how we figure out, can you stop injections? If Viagra starts giving you a really good response, then you stop injections. If you have good function before surgery, have excellent nerve sparing, and do rehab, you have probably a 7 to 80 percent chance at two years after surgery of being an excellent Viagra Levitra Cialis responder. So most of our patients do get off injections. Who doesn't get off injections? Those men who have venous leak. What about ED treatments? Well, the history of ED therapy started in the 60s when we thought everyone was crazy and we, of course, now realize that that's not true. All we had was sex therapy in the 1960s. In 1970s, some pioneers like Bill Furlow at the Mayo Clinic developed the modern penile implant, but that's the only thing we had. In the 80s, penile injection therapy was introduced by two physicians, a British physician, Giles Brindley, and a, a Paris physician, Ronald Virag, and of course, injection therapy has been around ever since. MUSE, the urethral suppository, was introduced in 1997. Viagra was introduced in 1998. And in 2004, uh, Levitra and Cialis became available. And there are several compounds, pills, gels, and shots that are in development at the moment. So it's likely we will see new drugs in our kind of arsenal over the course of the next few years. So just to refresh your memory, when we get aroused, we release this chemical here, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide causes the stimulation of enzymes inside the penis smooth muscle that result in accumulation of this compound here, cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP is broken down by an enzyme. It's called PDE5, phosphodiesterase 5. Cyclic GMP is a good thing. It causes that muscle to relax and expand. Blood flows in. The, the valve mechanism functions. But PD-5 breaks it down, and that's how we stay flaccid during the day, when we're not, we're not erect. PD-5 inhibitors, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, block this enzyme, allow the accumulation of cyclic GMP, and that's how those pills work. But for those pills to work, you need this master chemical up here. You need nitric oxide. If you do not have nitric oxide, 
You cannot generate cyclic GMP, and PD5 inhibitors don't work very well. The predominant amount of nitric oxide comes from the nerves that supply the erection tissue. And that's why the two populations of men who respond most poorly to these drugs are diabetics with nerve autonomic neuropathy in their penis and radical prostatectomy and radical cystectomy patients. This is just very briefly comparing the three drugs. People come all in all the time and say, well, how does Viagra compare to Levitra or compare to Cialis? The duration of action of Viagra and uh, Levitra is about 12 hours. Now, the package insert says four hours, but it's been well shown in a number of studies for both drugs that these drugs really function very well for 8 to 12 hours. Now, the problem with the four-hour window is it actually makes it very difficult to integrate these drugs into your sex life because both have an effect of food on them. If you have this pill in your stomach at the same time of food, you're likely to drop the dose that's absorbed by 30%. So these are drugs that really need to be taken on an empty stomach. And then we tell all of our patients that we want them taking it two hours before your evening meal. They last for 12 hours. Dinner at 7, you take it at 5 o'clock, you're good till well after midnight. That's what we tell our patients so they remember. If you take it after a meal, people say, well, when should I take it after a meal? The problem is that it depends on what you've eaten and how much you've had to drink from an alcohol standpoint. Because fatty food and alcohol will prevent the stomach from emptying, and so food stays in there longer. So to be safe, we tell patients you want to take it no sooner than two hours after the completion of a meal. Two hours before a meal, two hours after the completion of a meal. If you have 8 o'clock dinner reservations, but you don't feel it till 10, Strictly speaking, I wouldn't want you taking these pills till you're after, it's after midnight. Not very integratable into your love life. That's why we suggest you take it beforehand. Cialis, on the other hand, is clearly a 36-hour drug, and for some men, even a 48-hour drug. Speed of onset, Viagra and Levitra are quicker, and Cialis is slower. Cialis has no food effect. There's no negative effect of food on Cialis, but it is a slower onset drug. And the side effects, generally mild. The classic side effects are headache, facial flushing, nasal congestion, heartburn, blurred vision, or that blue halo effect, that loss of color vision. Cialis has a, as a side effect muscle aches in about 10% of men. And for some men, those muscle aches are very severe. So Viagra is the drug that has the highest instance of visual side effects, and Levitra the lowest instance uh, of um, side effects overall. What about penile injections? Usually people cringe when they see this photograph. Penile injections got introduced in 1983. 90% of men in my practice who use penile injections have a penetration hardness erection, an erection good enough for sexual intercourse. The average man gets an erection in five minutes, and it lasts, on average, 30 minutes. We are comfortable with up to a 90-minute penetration hardness erection. This is the best drug that we have for erections. What's the biggest problem? The mental image needle and penis. Makes people very, very nervous. In our practice, injection training is a very important part of our program. We have two nurses who are devoted to running the penile injection training program. Joe Narris, who's a nurse practitioner, and Pam Mascioli, who's a nurse. And it's two visits. And over those two visits, we teach the men how to inject, but we also figure out what's a good dose to start off on at home. And when I say a good dose, what I'm really saying is a safe dose. And I say safe dose because the only real medical problem with penile injections is the concept of priapism, getting an erection that you can't get rid of. You see those ads on TV, erections lasting longer than four hours, call your doctor. That's priapism, named after the Greek god of lust and fertility, Priapus. So priapism is an absolute urologic emergency. This is nothing to be snickered at. People say, oh, I think it's just an advertising gimmick. It's not. It's a very serious problem. Why? No blood flow after two hours in your penis, and the erection tissue starts to degenerate. And men who have bad priapism, men who come in at 12 hours, often have permanent erection tissue damage and will never be a good pill and sometimes not even a good injection responder. So priapism is a serious problem, and that's why we have two visits to really figure out what's a safe dose. How many units should he be using on his first injection at home, which is injection number three? Other than that, injection therapy is very safe and very effective. Patients ask us all the time because they go to the internet, a double-edged sword for medical education. 
and they read on the internet that penile injection causes fibrosis, scarring of erectile tissue. I will tell you very, very clearly that there is no evidence in animals, in humans, in petri dishes that injection therapy causes scarring of erection tissue. If it causes scarring of erection tissue, it's microscopic scarring which is not going to cause you any significant problem. If you inject properly and follow the guidelines that we have in our practice, you will not run into any problems. What about transurethral prostaglandin? Well, that's a suppository about the size of an, uh, uh, Uncle Ben's grain of rice. It goes into the urethra, the urine channel, and got released in 1997, and it was thought, wow, nobody's going to ever be injecting again. The problems for transurethral prostaglandin, which is called MUSE, is that it works in about 40% of men. It's not particularly consistent, and if you don't have insurance coverage, it's very expensive. The upside is it's really easy to use. 40% of men do respond, and there's no needle involved. And so this is an option for the vast majority of men with erectile problems. For the patient who's had a radical prostatectomy, in the early stages after surgery, the doses that are required to give a good erection often cause burning penile pain. Now that pain goes away with time, usually in the second year after surgery. But in that first year after surgery, 1,000 micrograms of muse, which is the highest dose and the dose that we typically use for erection, that dose often causes penile pain. But it's a very safe form of treatment. What about vacuum devices? Vacuum devices, a lot of interest in vacuum devices as a rehabilitation strategy. We don't yet have solid evidence to show that vacuum devices are a good rehabilitation strategy. However, for the majority of men who use them, you can get an erection. The erection may not look normal, it may not feel normal, you have to wear a ring around the base of your penis, which for some men is uncomfortable, but it is an option for you. And it's very, very safe, and it's reasonably effective. I will tell you, however, in my practice, many men drop out from using the vacuum device, particularly younger couples, uh, over the first six months after they start using it. Penile implant surgery. Penile implant surgery is third stage treatment. First stage pills. Second stage injections, MUSE, vacuum devices, third stage penile implant. Penile implants in my practice are reserved for men who have at least tried injections. That means at least trying it in the office. Most men who have implant surgery in my practice have tried and failed injection therapy. Men with significant venous leaks, significant erection tissue damage which prevented them responding to injection therapy and their only viable option was penile implant surgery. Now, if you look at the medical literature and look at satisfaction of all the treatments we have, pills, injections, implants, the highest satisfaction rate is with implants. Why? It's got two distinct advantages. 100% hard, 10 seconds to get an erection. And so if you think back to when you were 18 years of age, they're the two attributes of your erection at that age, quick and hard. And so it introduces or reintroduces reasonable spontaneity into your sexual relationship. On the downside, it's an operation. For most men, it's come in the morning, go home the afternoon. It takes about an hour to do the procedure, sometimes less. Go home the same day, pain, swelling, and bruising for two to four weeks after surgery. You take seven working days off work in our practice. 3% of implants get infected. It means they have to be removed. They can be replaced immediately. That's called salvage implant surgery. But that does require a second operation. You cannot just treat an infected implant with antibiotics. And the second thing is that about 15 to 20 percent of them will break down over the first 10 years because they're mechanical devices and there's two blowouts that occur. However, 10 years after surgery, 85 percent of men have the same implant they had day one and 97 percent of men never had an infection. What about sexual nutraceuticals? If you stay up late at night, 11.30, you're on cable TV, you get Dr. Stephen H. Becker or somebody on there who I'm sure is a uh, an actor, and it's convincing to use Enzyde or NRX or Viramax or Arginmax, all of these supplements that are pitched as a pharmaceutical. They're called nutraceuticals. The problem with nutraceuticals is as follows. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that has no FDA regulation. They're not under any regulatory control. They can say whatever they want on an advertisement, on the television, 
on the internet, uh, in a magazine, they can say what they can say. 99% of men end up getting a 12-inch penis by using this. It can it can be as ridiculous as you as as it can be, but they're not under any regulatory control. If you look at the Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis drug trials. And if you look at those trials, and the men who were receiving a placebo, a sugar pill, 30% of them responded to the sugar pill. And what that means is that there's a psychological component for every man who has erection problems. And you give him a placebo, and at least for a short period of time, he's going to say, yeah, my erections are better. And this is almost certainly how most of these sexual nutraceuticals work, is that it's a placebo response rate. Now, two words of caution. Some of these sexual nutraceuticals contain androgens, testosterone, DHEA, androstenedione. And for a man with prostate cancer, that's potentially problematic. So be very careful. The problem for you is that they may not tell you they contain testosterone-like products. The other issue is that we now know that many of these products actually have low doses of Viagra, Levitra, or Cialis in them. And so you get the facial flushing, you get the nasal congestion, you say, oh yeah, this stuff is working because they got a little bit of Viagra in there. And so be very, very cautious. And I tell patients who come in with their bottles of whatever it is that you're really probably wasting your money and that you're better off using, using a, um, a drug. What about the future? Well, if you've had radiation for your prostate cancer, if you've had surgery for your prostate cancer, this is what I see the future being. I've already told you about the endothelium, and I think we will be using drugs to protect that endothelial tissue inside your penis. PD-5 inhibitors do this. We know this. There's excellent animal and human evidence that PD-5 inhibitors, Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis, protect endothelium, not just on the penis, but in your heart. And it's likely that the future of PD-5 inhibitors will be in vascular health protection, and we'll all someday, like an aspirin, be using low-dose PD-5 inhibitor probably not Viagra, but some other drug down the road. The other drug class that protects endothelium are statins. Lipitor, um, Crestor, Zocor, Simvastatin, those kind of drugs. And I think it's only a short period of time before we start adding statins in to our penile rehabilitation program. Because they're such great drugs for the endothelium. I already told you that nerve injury with surgery is a big problem for erectile function recovery. There are many drugs being explored for the purposes of protecting those nerves or helping those nerves regenerate. Uh, there are many classes of drugs being looked at. None of them have yet been shown uh, to be a benefit in the prostatectomy population at this point in time. And finally, I told you that there's a lot of muscle inside that erection chamber, like your biceps. And we know that erections protect that muscle. So whether you're using injections, PD-5 inhibitors, urethral suppositories, you're getting fresh blood going into your penis, stretching of the penis, and that's probably protecting your erection tissue. And that's probably how nighttime erections work. There's a question mark beside vacuum device because we don't bring oxygen into our penis by using a vacuum device. There's very low levels of oxygen because you're bringing old blood back into the penis, it is believed. So there's a question mark about whether vacuum devices actually protect erection tissue. Hopefully in the very near future we will have trials that will be conducted here that will answer that question. The two hot areas at the moment are gene therapy and stem cell therapy. Now gene therapy has actually already gone in to human trials. Dr. Arnold Melman, the chairman of urology at Montefiore Medical Center, has a, a gene therapy trial in a very small number of patients that is showing very promising results. It requires to be done in many more men. I think, if I remember correctly, there's about 10 men who have been in the study. But this is very interesting. The idea would be that you give a man a shot of a gene into his penis that may actually help his erectile function for several months, not just that night, but he might be getting a shot perhaps every three months to protect his erectile tissue or help his erectile function. In animal studies at the moment, but not yet in human studies, is the concept of stem cells. Now, these are not embryonic stem cells. These are fat tissue-derived stem cells, adipose tissue-derived stem cells. And if you put them into the penis, they actually develop into smooth muscle cells. So not alone may we be able to help men who already have erection problems by having them recover, but we may be able to reverse venous leak. 
Now, this is a very exciting area. I have to tell you, I think we're probably five to 10 years off from stem cells being used for erectile dysfunction. But stay tuned for that. So what about testosterone replacement? These are the last slides, and then we'll open, we'll open up for questions. So there are many means of giving testosterone. Testosterone should be given to men who have a low testosterone level, who have symptoms. We talked about those symptoms earlier on. There are pills available. They are not available in the United States of America. They are available in Europe and the rest of the world. And the problem is that some of those pills cause liver damage and they're not FDA approved. So we don't use pills in the States. There are gels. There are two gels available. There's Androgel and there's a gel called Testum. There are patches which have pretty much gone out of favor, androderm and testoderm. Why? Because a significant proportion of men were getting allergic reactions to the patches. And the gels have kind of supplanted the patches. There are injections, short-term injections, where men take an injection, an intramuscular injection, every week, 10 days, every two weeks, every three weeks, depending on the, the level of their testosterone. But there, are, there is a drug in development. It's available in Europe. It's called Nebido, N-E-B-I-D-O which we hopefully will hear about towards the end of this year, which is a shot that you take about every 10 weeks. And so stay tuned for that. And I think that it's very likely that we will see that approved in the United States in the future. And certainly men who are on injections, who get tired of injecting every 10 days, uh, I think this is a very good option. There's also a pellet now FDA approved in America. It's called Testopel. It's a series of pellets that are injected under the skin. It's absorbed and injections occur every 14 weeks. So again, two long-term strategies. In the average male with low testosterone, the normal range is approximately 3 to 800. When the testosterone level goes below 300 and the man has symptoms, low libido, low energy, mood changes, decreased strength, decreased endurance, then testosterone replacement therapy is very safe and very effective. The issue for you sitting in front of me tonight as a prostate cancer group is, is testosterone replacement therapy safe in a man with prostate cancer? And so five years ago, if you'd asked us that question, we would have said no. Today, the package insert, the labeling on all of these products says that these products are contraindicated, not allowed to be used in men with prostate cancer. And the reason for that goes back to the 1940s when Charles Huggins, who was a urologist at University of Chicago, showed that when men had metastatic prostate cancer, that when they had their testicles removed, that their prostate cancer regressed. He showed that, actually, in only three patients. And he went on to win the Nobel Prize for that research. And so we have taken that information, and we have processed it in our minds at the FDA and among urologists and medicine in general as meaning that giving testosterone is like adding fuel to the fire. That if you give testosterone, you're going to activate those prostate cancer cells and it's going to cause prostate cancer in somebody who doesn't have it or it's going to cause recurrence of prostate cancer in a man who's after surgery or radiation. But that's not how it works. So this is a slide that was given to me by Dr. Abraham Morgan Taylor, who's in Boston. And so sometimes we think that giving testosterone to a man with prostate cancer is like this guy parachuting into this lake that's surrounded by these crocodiles that it's imminent danger. And in fact, and again, this is Abe Morgan Taylor's slide, and he's the gentleman who's written most about testosterone replacement in prostate cancer patients. There's a concept called saturation. That once you get your blood level of testosterone gets to a certain level, and that level is probably not very high. Let's pick a level of, let's say, 100 or 150. When your testosterone level goes above that, there is no further activation of the prostate cells or prostate cancer cells. That they are fully activated at very low levels of testosterone. So if you come to see me and your level of testosterone is 250 in the low range and you have symptoms, that the prostate cells are probably already completely stimulated by the amount of testosterone that you have. And raising your testosterone level from 250 to 600 is not going to make any difference. Now, I will tell you that if you come in to see me next week and you say, I've got low testosterone, I want testosterone, I have my prostate out last year, that the first thing I'll tell you is that we do not have large studies with long-term follow-up. I cannot tell you that we have a 1,000 men followed for 10 years and I can prove to you that testosterone supplementation is safe. We do not have that. What I can tell you is that virtually all of the experts in the field of sexual medicine and many of the prostate cancer experts 
now say that in the carefully selected man who's had surgery and the carefully selected man who's had radiation for prostate cancer, that we will allow them to use testosterone supplementation. And we now have about 35 men in this practice, post-prostatectomy, who are on testosterone supplementation. If they have a Gleason 7 or a Gleason 6 or less, we've not had one PSA recurrence, and several of those men are more than three years on testosterone. So stay tuned because I think this is a very uh, important area. It's a hot topic in urology, and we are going to see more information over the next few years. I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going to show you one slide, and I show this to you cautiously. Penny Damascus gave me permission to show you this slide. And this book is written for guys like you. And it was written because guys like you came to me and said, I wish I had something to read before I decided on treatment. And this is a book that's devoted to understanding how treatment of prostate cancer causes erection problems. And every single treatment we talked about earlier on is gone into extreme detail in this book, including the concept of penile rehabilitation.